Welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast with your host, Johnny Gorky. You have the power to overcome challenges and fears. Let my voice and the voice of many others show you how to transform these challenges into opportunities. To learn more about future podcasts and read episode show notes, check out my website at www.thepowerofyourvoice.com. This is episode 20, and today's guest is Ben Stein. Welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast, Ben. Ben Stein is a founder, coach, and podcast host of At Purpose Up, where he helps struggling professionals get unstuck and design their life with purpose and intention. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Johnny. It's great to be here. Thank you. So my first question for you is, you discovered your purpose in life, and that is to help others unlock theirs. How did you discover your purpose? You know, it's a, it's a good, good question. And it was from following various threads. So I think a lot of us wait around for that grand epiphany where our purpose is just going to hit us. And it's like, oh, I've found my purpose. For some people, that happens like that. And for others, it is a process. And for those of you out there listening, I would say trust the process, even though it's, it's frustrating. It's like we all want to like find this purpose, like it's, uh, like it's hidden under a rock. But in actuality, it is a series of decisions and feedback that we get about what lights us up versus what zaps our energy. So as an illustration of this, I was, um, say about four or five years back, I was coaching on the side. I was working in my job. Um, at a at a dot com and it was comfortable but I wasn't inspired by it and so uh, I was like I want to figure out what my purpose is so that's when I started the purpose up podcast because I didn't know if coaching was the thing um, I just I wasn't sure and I didn't want to make the the wrong decision I think a lot of us get hung up on making the wrong decision so we make no decisions at all and that is counterproductive to us figuring things out because uh, what is going to help us more then thinking is taking action. And like, if, if you guys get nothing out, nothing else from listening to this today, take action instead of trying to figure it out because figuring it out will probably lead to more frustration. So going back to my story, I started the Purpose Up podcast because I wanted to ask people who are living purpose-led lives that question, like, what's your purpose? And have them give tips to other people. And, you know, some common themes arose from that, that, um, serving others, you know, is huge. Figuring out how you can serve others. Two, finding purpose in what you currently do. So a lot of us, you know, are in jobs and we just need to kind of reframe the way we look at it. So I, um, there's a great purpose expert, Zach Mercurio, and he has a great book called The Invisible Leader. And um, he just talks about how you can reframe the job that you're in in how you're serving people. So there's like two examples that come up. One is like his own example when he's a um, radio sales guy and he understands later that he was really helping support small businesses flourish with the service he was providing. Now he didn't see it at that time and, and he's glad he didn't see it that way at the time because it led him on his purpose quest and now he teaches all about purpose and I highly recommend his book, The Invisible Leader. But one of the case studies that he cites in this book is a woman who worked as a cleaning lady in a dorm and she did it for a number of years and then she retired and then she went back and in an interview with her, they were like, you know, why did you go back to this? Like you didn't need to. And she's like, I couldn't stand the thought of these young women in this dorm, not having someone to be able to talk to about all their problems. So while she was a cleaning lady, she was also serving this like other purpose within her job um, of, of being a sounding board and being a, a wise woman to uh, these girls in the dorm. Yeah, well, speaking of business, so there are people who want to be entrepreneurs. You are one. How did you overcome the fear of entrepreneurship and overcome the challenges of leaving a safe job, you know, as a VP of product management in corporate America? Uh, good question. Good question. I always wanted to become an entrepreneur and I had a story in my head that I'm not the entrepreneurial type and that 
story stuck with me for a couple of years. So I think I was probably ready about 10 years ago to become an entrepreneur, but I was like, no, now's not the right time. Now's not the right time. And we never want to like go back and rewrite history. But my son was born and I wanted to live by example. And, and, and I thought if I do not try this, you know, it is okay to try and fail, but it's not okay not to try. And I wanted to really live by example. And I was like, what, it, what is worse? Like waking up each day knowing that I'm living a comfortable life, but not one that I'm passionate about or living one that I'm passionate about where, you know, I'm, I'm figuring out how to make money. And, uh, you know, choice B was ultimately, you know, where I wanted to go. Because I think it's useful to look at what our perspective is going to be like from our deathbed. What are our regrets going to be, Right. And I don't think we're ever going to regret taking a risk and having it work out or not. We're always going to love having taken that risk, but we may regret not trying, right? Exactly. So that's, I mean, that's, that's where my head was at. And, and it's tough. And, you know, it, it still is, is a challenge, to be perfectly honest. It's not like I, I left work and, and, I, and I'm bringing in the dough as an entrepreneur. You know, it's like, big, like it, it brings like this whole new new set of personal growth challenges, figuring out, okay, how much value am I providing? How do I um, charge for my value? How do I personally feel about what I'm charging? And how do I show up every day in a way that is attracting people, that's providing value, and in a way that people want to exchange money for that because they're going to get so much more out of it. So it's, what I do love about it is it's like a challenge every day. And since I'm a personal growth junkie, it's like, being put in the personal growth ringer to kind of figure out where all your, where all your self-limiting beliefs are and, and where you get to grow. Well, the beautiful thing too, think about, you know, I've worked at corporate America just for four years and I quit <laughs> after hardcore leadership. And the big thing is people work in corporate America doing the same job every single day for what, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, you get bored. What you do, you know, helping people create their purpose, everyone's purpose is different, which is such a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's true. And to that end, uh, we are all unique. And I don't know if I would have said this a few years ago, but I, I do believe that we each have a soul. And that is separate from our ego brain, which is there to keep us safe and to solve simple problems. And if we let it go unchecked, all it will want to do is solve simple problems and I'm, I'll, I'll just go into a little tangent trying to figure out what next cell phone to get was my procrastination tool because of the little analyzer inside my head just wanted to figure out a simple problem of matching up different features and phones to figure out what to get next versus figuring out this bigger challenge of me stepping into being a huge promoter for for this book launch that i'm working on because that was a little bit scarier than figuring out what book launch, uh, what to do for the book launch. But going back to the question, you know, I do believe that, that we all have a soul and we all have intuition. And for me, part of my journey was really tapping into getting grounded in my heart and really being able to listen to it. Um, and that was so important for me in my journey. And as we all figure out what our purpose is, it's really tuning into that inside. It may not even be a voice, but the feeling about what feels good, what doesn't, as we feel along our path. And I spent too many years numbing myself, trying not to feel that so I could just kind of go with the, the drift, as, uh, as Michael Strasner calls it. Yeah, well, going into finding your purpose, this is a good question I have for you. So Ben, can you tell us a little bit about your past struggles with addiction, anxiety, and how that has helped you discover your purpose? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, going back, I mean, I was like a chubby kid. So, you know, growing up, I, I had a suburban DC, a pretty well-to-do upbringing. And as with any family, it has its, uh, its own quirks. So those quirks for me was um, a um, psychiatrist dad who, who worked a lot. And he's, he's an amazing man, an amazing woman as a mother, but she also um, suffered from depression. So I was also like a third kid. So for me, it was a struggle being seen and I was often not really the focus of attention. So I would either like be funny as a way to get attention or I would kind of withdraw. And it was painful. I mean, a lot of kids experience pain, my pain, you know, and lots of kids go through 
tons worse. But the way that I started dealing with pain was eating. That was like a great way. And I became chubby as a kid. That became a great way to kind of numb myself. And as I grew older and looked to gain acceptance from peers, I kind of fell in with a group that liked to drink and, and smoke pot. And then, you know, as a 14 year old with my parents kind of both struggling with, with their stuff, that was like a perfect escape for me from my negative feelings. And that just kind of like continued on as that kind of just became a, um, a self-medication and a coping mechanism. And, and then it was kind of like I didn't learn how to cope with negative emotions without it. So I kind of kept with me through my late 20s. So I was always like pretty functional and I'd always get my work done. But it also, um, it also created a, a great disconnect where it was hard to create intimacy with friends. It was hard to create intimacy with girlfriends because if I was always numb and I was always trying to keep myself from feeling pain, then I wouldn't allow myself to feel like real love and get really close to people because I was, you know, still the, the kid in me didn't want to get hurt again. So I just kind of keep people at arm's length. So I think it was just kind of self-medication coping mechanism and how that's allowed me to understand with my clients and with myself, if I ever go to those negative places, how our ego likes to deal with stuff. So our ego is just, again, trying to be comfortable as opposed to trying to live into our purpose. So it, it's going to go into any way it can to go be comfortable. And, you know, some people it's food, some people it's TV, some people it's, you know, whatever, you know, your, your, your poison is. Realizing that learning how to become mindful, managing your mind, and not letting that ego story run your head, or not letting your numbing mechanisms run the show, um, is is a way for you to step into your power. So going into the end of your 20s, you know, you had to deal with your emotions. You know, some of us guys probably, you know, we have a hard time with emotions anyway. So how did you overcome the challenge and what caused you to start listening to your intuitions? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really get to the end of my 20s and think, man, I got to start listening to my intuition there was a couple of hints along the way, like there'd be a job that looked good on paper that I wasn't excited about. You know, now I realized I was ignoring my intuition and going for that external validation. Like, oh, I'd be dumb not to take this job based on what other people think, right? So I had been numbing myself for so long. I'd, I'd created kind of like this, what I like into like a, a dark hole inside myself that was just kind of becoming more gaping and large and feeling more alienated and alienated, even though I was hanging out with friends and, and drinking and quote, having a good time. So it kind of came to a head just one day in my office when I wanted to like break down and cry and I didn't know why. And that was unlike me. And I was like, okay, it's, it's time for me to get help and, and deal with my stuff. So that started my, my healing journey. And I've been holding on to not talking about a lot of stuff for a while because I didn't feel safe talking about my friends with it. And I didn't really have people close to me that I felt safe talking about the sort of stuff with, nor did I really even know how deep I needed to go with my parent stories. But anyways, I first went to like a psychiatrist and within like a matter of 10 minutes, I'm uh, you know, I, I'm getting all scared about burying my soul, but really looking forward to it. And within about 10 minutes, he's like, what can I get you? And I'm like, huh? He's like, oh, what do you, what do you need? And he was just kind of a, um, a pill prescriber. And that kind of really took the wind out of my sails. Like I was like, geez, like I'm, I was ready to like get healed on a spiritual level. And I just got offered an antidepressant. So I, you know, I tried it out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn something down to see what it does to me uh, at that point. You know, it just made me more numb and, and I didn't need that. I, I have this vivid memory of going on a business trip and I was in the Charlotte airport and they've got these rockers and I was just like sitting in a rocker and I was like, man, I am numb and this sucks. So um, then I, I went to therapy and therapy was good for a while, for a few months. It was like cathartic, talked about my, my past. And then the, the challenge was I, I kept falling into this pattern of like, what's wrong this week? And asking myself that question that seemed like totally counterproductive. So um, uh, an ex-girlfriend at that time gave me an, a free life coaching session. Um, and then I was, my curiosity was piqued. And, and then I turned that into a uh, weekend intensive, which was mind blowing. And then turned that into a six month intensive. And I was like, made some amazing changes in my life. And that turned into a coach and training program. And 
I was, I was off to the races. Well, it's incredible how you were able to overcome that. Cause honestly, you know, if you started binge drinking, especially at like 14 years old, then you go see a psychologist and then he wants to give you pills knowing your background, you could have actually started getting addicted to medication, but because you were at that level, you realize, no, I don't want this. Yeah. I mean, and, and the, the interesting thing was, is, uh, one, I, I realized I had an addictive personality early on in my teen years because like cigarettes used to be such a struggle for me. And just like, I, I kept going back to cigarettes for a while. So I knew early on that I could get addicted to things. And second, I saw the effect of um, antidepressants um, that they had on my mom. And that was heartbreaking to me because, you know, back when she was starting on them, they had some, some ones that had like more side effects and, and, and some of them made her like really spaced out. So I was like, you know, my mom isn't fully there. And I was just like, you know, modern medicine is not the way for me. I'd, I'd prefer to self-medicate uh, versus anything else. Um, but yeah, I, I had a strain still do have like an aversion to um, any pharmacology. But it's great how you actually discovered your intuition. You started listening to yourself. You know, that's something for, especially us guys, it can be very challenging to do that. And you did it. You know, you yeah. saw what was happening to your mom and your past and you realized, you know, being addicted to cigarettes and things like that, if you would start taking pills, you would be addicted to it. So you didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I mean, what was funny about me was I would, I always, um, I was still like very responsible, even though I would, you know, drink a lot and self-medicate. So I remember like in high school, it was always like, all right, let me get my homework done. Then I can go smoke pot. <laughs> you know, that was kind of like how I, how I operated and how I got into a good school, et cetera. So, you know, I was, I was lucky to have some, some intelligence um, to, to counteract the pity that I was doing to my brain. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was always important to me to be able to keep a certain level of functionality. Otherwise I, I, um, I wouldn't have been able to justify my lifestyle to myself. You mentioned your book. So, so you just wrote your first book, writing a book is a great way for people to share their purpose with other people. So how were you able to write your first book and what advice do you have for anyone who's listening right now? You know, a lot of people always say, Oh, I, you know, my life, I could write a book about it. How were you able to write this book? And what did you learn through the entire experience of writing your first book? So my first book is Little Benny Piggy in Courage for the Win. And it is a children's book. Hopefully the, the title uh, lends itself to you thinking that. For me, I, I always had a passion for producing content for, for children. Actually, like leaving college, I was like, oh, I want to get into children's television. Had a couple parts of my career where I actually did participate in that. So this um, was, was, was kind of going back to making something for children because, you know, there's, I've got this fun sense of childlike and play um, in me. You know, for example, Jim Henson is one of my heroes uh, because of the worlds he creates. But anywho, um, I always thought it would be awesome to write an illustrated children's book. So, you know, we, we, you mentioned hardcore leadership earlier. We had an option for a personal project for hardcore leadership, this leadership program uh, we've both been through. And, and this is what I decided on because um, I was like, this is a great deadline. You know, I had about four, four months-ish to do it. And I was like, let's just see if I can get it done. And so what was great is it's all about feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And that's the definition of courage. And it's so important when we're talking about living our purpose because it can be scary. Like any steps we make, like starting a podcast and putting yourself out there, um, you know, doing lives and worrying about what people will think of you, et cetera. But on the other side of that is growth. Um, it's where you, where you get to stretch and it's where you get to become the person that you want to be. Right. And so this message of feeling the fear and doing it anyway, um, totally was, was, was resonating with me um, as I was leading the fir leaving the first part of this leadership program. And I just kind of ended up writing it in the course of an hour or two. I mean, it's a relatively short book that rhymes, but I was, it's kind of like one of those things that people talk about when you're inspired. It just, it was like channeling through me. And I originally wanted to do the artwork for it. And I started doing that. I um, mean, I had some sketches for it. But I was like, this is just not going to create the book that I see in my mind. And it's just not going to be as beautiful or as, you know, kind of like desirable 
for little kids to go through. So then I, I made it, it was a tough decision for me to hire an illustrator. So what I did is I found an illustrator on a freelance site. I did the character designs and I did the layouts and she brought them to life. So the writing was relatively easy because it was, it was inspired. The drawing was fun, took a little bit longer. And then, um, yeah, and then figuring out like, okay, I wanted to do a Kickstarter because I'd always wanted to do a Kickstarter and raise awareness around it. You know, that it's been fun thinking about that strategy. So it's been a, a time crunch challenge, but it's been a lot of fun too, stepping into learning all these different things and seeing it come together so quickly. Yeah, well, I think what you did with your book is so beautiful because I can only speak from my own personal experience, but for a kid to be able to read a book, that encourages them to do something. Like I didn't have the father figure to say, you know what, you stutter, but you know what, stand up in front of the classroom and read a book anyways. I didn't have that. So to write a book that kids can read and they can understand it's fun, it is short, but it encourages them to go do something anyways. Even though, yeah, it might be scary, but do it anyways. Instead of, oh no, you're scared, don't do it, don't do it. Because what happens when we're children, when we're scared to do something, that goes into our adulthood and then, you know, that goes 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And some of us, they never overcome that kind of stuff. So be able to be able to learn it at such a young age, which is so powerful. So thank you so much for writing the book. And where did you come up with the name Benny? Where, where uh, I mean, this is, this is semi-autobiographical. Um, so I, I, was, I was channeling my, my small chubby child. So I was like, oh, um, I was actually Benji as a child. So it's not fully autobiographical, but I always wished I'd been called Benny. Yeah, it was just like first it was like, oh, why don't I just call him Little Benny Piggy? And then it stuck. Um, and I didn't want to think of an alternate name. So, and then I was like messing with Benny Piggy, but Little Benny Piggy seemed a lot cuter. And yeah, so uh, it's very much my story in a lot of ways where I felt, you know, in it, he talks about feeling a little bit fat and not feeling very athletic. And that's, you know, uh, a struggle of mine when I was younger you know, not being the most like coordinated kid, not being the most athletic. And, you know, that kind of, I felt compounded some of the fears I have since I didn't fit in and, and wasn't, you know, kind of one of, one of the alphas of the class, if you will. You know, I wish I had felt the fear and, and did more as, as a youngster because um, I think it held me back. And when you think about adults, you know, adults have the same thing. They need to feel the fear and do it anyway in whatever they're doing. And like you said, some stuff, stays with you from a young age and you still need to be courageous to step out of that when you're older. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is, you know, you mentioned, you know, you illustrate your own stuff, but you still hired somebody else. So for a challenge for some people, it's like they want to write a book, but they don't have the gift that you have. You're able to illustrate your own stuff, but at the same time, you're like, you know what, the way I'm going to do is going to be different. So let me hire somebody else. So that's the big thing. You don't have to know how to do something in order to do it. You know, you can write a book yourself, but hire somebody else to do it. Don't stop doing something just because you don't know how to do it yourself. Right. And, and to that end, I'm glad you brought that up because, and this is like a, a very important point. So many of us, including myself, lone wolf it. We feel like we need to do everything on our own. And the like the support like bringing in people to support you is so crucial for you becoming your best person whether it's an accountability group a mastermind a coach um, don't do things on your own because it's going to be more painful it's going to be less fun like for you to be successful people need to help you and you need to be open to that help instead of feeling like you need to figure out everything on your own you know when we talk about a group program like leadership for example like you know, I'm, I'm asking people for help in supporting getting the Kickstarter off the ground. I was talking to a, a social media friend, you know, that, you know, Jess, I was like, oh, what are some good ideas about social media? And she's like, oh, and then, hey, you need to talk to, um, you know, Jackie, who's done so many Kickstarters. And Jackie gave me some like really important Kickstarter strategy information that like um, is totally important to me. So having those networks of people that are supportive and that you are open to that support is huge in you. Um, being successful. And so, for example, like I could have shot and edited my Kickstarter video, like I have that skill set, but I know someone who's done it and has expertise in that and has more time, frankly, did it. And, and, I'm, and I'm happy with like the Kickstarter video, for example. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, it's being a lot more efficient too. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, don't, 
don't lone wolf it. <laughs> as, as so many of us do, but we don't have to. That's the beautiful thing. And it's so much more fun. And sometimes too, I realize sometimes we have a group of friends who do things that we don't know. And when we ask them for support, like, hey, by the way, I got this idea for something. They actually have somebody in their group that knows that is so extremely well. And we didn't know that. So it's like, there's a lot of support out there. We just have to be willing to ask for it. Right. Yeah. And so for example, I've spent part of this afternoon emailing tons of people that I've been coming across to promote this book. You know, uh, one story in my mind is like, Oh my God, I haven't spoken to these people in years. What are they going to think about me asking them for support? But on the other hand, it's like, you never know who is going to be excited about your idea and who's not. So it doesn't matter if some people are like, whatever, ignore it. Like they don't really care that much. Like oftentimes we think in our head, like, oh, they're going to think I'm stupid or I'm going to be judged for this when in fact they don't care. We make up stories in our mind and it's just better to like go for something rather than stay in our stories. Yeah, well, and the, that's the thing. A lot of times we think other people are thinking about us, but really they're thinking about themselves. <laughs> I wanted to mention, what made you decide to launch the Hilarious website? I hope I don't kill it because my gosh, man, and I'm going to post a link to that. That is so hilarious. I love the pictures that you post on there. Thank you. Thank you. So that's my, that's my dad blog. And I'm glad you asked that question because I was, I was thinking about going there. So when I was uh, a pre-dad, um, I'm now a dad to a 13, 13 month old, almost 14 month old Noah. I was scared. You know, I was scared. And, and the thing was, we didn't know if we were having a boy or a girl. So, you know, the thing that the refrain that was going in my head was like, oh, I hope I don't kill it. You know, that was like the objective about having a kid was, was just making sure that you kept it alive because it just seemed terrifying. You just bring this thing home from a hospital and, you know, there's no instruction manual. And you're just like, okay, let's go. Coinciding with that, I was being coached by um, a woman named Holly Woods. And, you know, when we talk about purpose, one of the exercises that she had me do was think about what are the things that we enjoyed as a child? And one of those things for me was drawing and cartooning. So on one hand, I felt a little bit silly as a 40 year old, you know, 39 year old guy picking up a pen and paper again and drawing cartoons. But then I was kind of like drawing silly cartoons about what they were talking about in birth class. You know, like for example, I didn't know that um, many women can give birth while kneeling as opposed to lying down. Right. And that was just kind of, funny and scary to me as we think about childbirth. So I drew a picture of that um, and, and that's, that's on the blog. Uh, and I started with just like pen and paper and I didn't think about it as a dad blog yet, but I just kept doing it and I was like, oh, this would be kind of fun if I did it electronically. So I picked up a, you know, a Wacom tab um, that I'd seen artists use before so I could draw it electronically, do it faster, color it in. And I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'll just try a dad blog. And that a lot of the times is how purpose works. We find our breadcrumbs along the way, right? And, you know, that could lead to a, you know, it could, it could pitter out, or it could lead to me making a um, book out of that and becoming a, you know, well-known dad blogger, like we, we don't know, and it could go either way, right? Um, but for me, it was like dealing with the fear about being a dad and also having like an outlet for writing that was a little bit less serious about the purpose stuff and more just kind of me as, as I look for my authentic voice. Yeah. Well, with the pictures that you post, they're brilliant. Anyone who has kids, I have three, so I can definitely relate to that. It's funny. And the things that you post on there is so extremely true. It's like, imagine having a child, you take them to the bathroom to change your diaper. They're screaming and yelling. And the person on the other side of the wall literally thinks that you're killing your child. But one thing I wanted, to, I was mentioning, well, I was going to mention is, Sometimes too, it's like in life, our purpose constantly changes. Like, you know, maybe for 10 years, your purpose is this one thing. And then now you're a father. Now your purpose is to take care and nurture your kid and to make sure the things that you say to do, you do it yourself as well. So your purpose is always changing. And sometimes your purpose remains the same, but you just add other purposes to, to it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way that I've heard some people talk about it is that your purpose is just kind of like, overarching sets of values tied with a overarching mission that you may or may not be able to achieve in your lifetime. So for example, you know, if you look at uh, Martin Luther King, you know, his purpose was to be able to um, 
you know, eradicate racism and promote equality between races, right? And that kind of went beyond his life. So it was huge. Uh, but within that, he had um, what, what some people refer to as like missions within that. So it's kind of like these different missions that ladder up to that purpose along the way. So you know, you're exactly right. It, it changes. But um, once you get clear on what your values are and what's really important to you, those missions that you take on can become more aligned with your purpose or not um, as you kind of dial in the focus of, of the direction you're going in. So for those listening right now who feel they are stuck doing something they, you know, they're, they're just not passionate about and they feel that, you know, they just haven't discovered their own purpose. What are three things that you would tell them in searching of their own purpose? Cause this is very important. So three things I would say, and I'll, I'll expand on them, is start meditating, start journaling, and take action. That, that's what I would do. And, and the reason why I'd say meditating is because for me, you know, we talked about that anxiety earlier, the ability to uh, ground yourself and to be able to observe your own thoughts and to not be in a, and, and to understand what it's like not to be in a reactive mode allows you to tap into your intuition and tap into this higher intelligence, which is really important for understanding where we want to go. It's like tapping into our own GPS. Two, journaling also um, allows us to get out of our own heads and, and it opens up some, some subconscious stuff that we might not otherwise have access to. So we can journal in a way to vent and that allows us to kind of have more of a blank slate to, for new ideas to come in instead of going over our same cycles again, we can also journal what we envision. And as we do that, one, we're, we're, we're spending more time focusing on what we want rather than what we don't want. And that's a powerful shift. Two, we, we start to see what resonates with us in terms of what our vision is so we can adjust accordingly. It's like if you're in a sailboat, you're changing the tack about where you want to sail to. And then three, over time, you're really just generating your own reality because you realize how powerful this is, the better it's like, you know, I, I liken it to going to the vision gym. The more you go to the gym and you flex those vision muscles, the better you get at it, the more your whole mindset shifts towards that as opposed to A, reacting or B, um, what you don't want. And then lastly, take action, right? Um, I'm a, I have been in the past a procrastinator and an overanalyzer, but nothing takes the place of taking action. And, you know, that can look like many different things. But if you've got something you're interested in it, like go for it. Don't talk yourself out of it. You know, I picked up um, some paintbrushes a couple of years ago and did a painting and it was so much fun. I mean, I haven't done it again since and I'd like to, you know, I started a blog a couple of times and it's been fun. Uh, started a podcast, just like start something. And, you know, you can think about monetizing it if, if money is the main goal, but think about what skills do I want to gain that will help me in, in whatever I do and I'd have fun doing and learning about and don't be too married to the outcome of it. Yeah. Journaling and meditating is extremely good. Now for some people who might be listening, I've never meditated my entire life. You know, why should they meditate and what kind of med meditation would you recommend? Because there are different ones. I mean, I think the, the meditation that you do is better than the meditation you don't do. That's number one. Um, I've also got a post on my blog that I can share with you um, how to start meditating. But what I often recommend to people to get started is with guided meditation. So they can kind of understand what it's like to feel their body, what it's like to have someone take you through the process so you can learn it first. So like Tara Brock has some great guided meditations. I know Tim Ferriss is a big fan of her. Um, you can also get... Um, you know, the popular apps that are out there. Calm is one. Um, I'm forgetting what the other one is. Headspace. Headspace is another huge one. I think a lot of people like Headspace. The one, One's got a girl narrator. One's got a guy narrator. So whatever your, your, your choice is. I just did a, I saw Deepak Chopra speak the other day or last month. And he offered like a, a 21 free guided meditation that was mantra meditation. So that's when you say a mantra over and over again. That's fun to experiment with. So I think start with committing yourself to like a few minutes a day to get a habit in and then just experiment with different types of it because it's fun to experiment. One of the things that I always say to people is like, people are like, oh, I suck at meditating. I, these thoughts always pop into my head. The point is to not not have thoughts. 
The point is to, when thoughts come back into your head, to acknowledge that, release them, and not beat yourself up over it. And as you meditate more, that space in between thoughts lengthens, but it never goes away. But the self-compassion that you can have for thinking a thought and letting it go and going back to your breath, going back to your mantra, whatever it is that you're staying present with, is kind of like the gym repetition of you know doing that bicep curl. The more you go back to your practice, that's how you get better at meditating. And that practice bleeds into the rest of your day where you're able to be more present more of the time and come back to being present. Yeah, well, meditating is really amazing. First time I actually ever did meditating was through hardcore. We were at the beach and somebody who's really good at meditating, we went through all the chakras and it was literally a mind out of, out of body experience. I've never experienced my entire life, but it was incredible. A lot, a lot of fun. So Ben, for people listening to this episode, what are some things you'd like them to take away from this episode? I mean, I'll, I'll reiterate a few things. Like one is, um, I mean, I can tell you not to get frustrated for not knowing your purpose, but that might be pointless, but don't beat yourself up and it doesn't need to be like a heavy thing. So try and think about how can it be fun to figure out what my purpose is. And that could be through talking with people, experimenting with different things. And how can I make this fun? And note that it's a action-based thing that you're getting feedback on versus something that, you know, the more that you sit there and torture yourself, your purpose is going to come to you. So that, that's not going to work. Two, always you can reach out to a, a mentor, a, a coach, someone who will help you stretch, hold yourself accountable because in your stretching, you're going to learn things about yourself and you're going to become more aligned with your purpose. Um, meditate, um, start with that, uh, journal, take action and, and really think about who it is you want to become. And, and what, I, what I would bet is there's a lot of people out there who know what type of person they want to be. And if they spend some time journaling on that, they'd get a lot more clear about what directions to start going in. And you don't need to know the exact destination and you don't need to know the exact how. You just need to take those first steps and the path will, like, like in old video games, you know, that path will just kind of make itself clear as opposed to having the map ahead of time. Yeah, well, mention the, the coaching one thing I've noticed through all these interviews and going through hardcore leadership and everything is the best coaches, you included, the best coaches are the ones who constantly get coached themselves. They don't stop educating themselves. They're constantly always trying to get better and better at what they do in their craft and to be able to help people more. Yeah. I mean, I think any, any person who's vision driven, who wants to change the world, wants to be able to increase their impact. And in order to increase their impact, they need to let go of their own self BS, right? I mean, I had one coach describe me as like, Ben, you are an airplane engine raring to go, but you are putting the brake on yourself. And it was like this like perfect metaphor that I was like holding myself back, like holding this energy back and holding my power back. And, you know, just because I'm, I'm, I'm scared of it, you know, it's like, I don't, you know, think I... Um, you know, I won't go into it, but the metaphor rang so true and it allowed me to get out of my head and into my heart to be able to serve people and be less concerned with the stories in my head and all of the kind of stuff that I was making up about my experience. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing how people can see things in us that sometimes we can't see in ourselves, but we kind of know. Yeah. No, I had one guy describe that phenomenon to me as uh, it's really hard to read the label on a pill bottle when you're inside it. Yeah, I like that. That's good. <laughs> so Ben, how can people purchase your new book, reach out to you for private coaching and find you online? So um, the book, if you guys are um, listening to this podcast when it comes out, um, littlebennypiggy.com. Actually, you know, the, the Kickstarter launches tomorrow, but for those, for those evergreen people, there'll probably be an Amazon link if this is um, in the future. My website, Purpose Up, uh, where my podcast is, that's purposeup.com, how it sounds. Um, you can get in touch with me there, learn more about me and my coaching. Um, and then I've got, um, you know, I hope I don't kill it.com for those dads out there, dads and moms that are looking for a uh, fun uh, respite, some humor. So you'll, you'll drop those links in there. 
Yes. Well, Ben Stein, thank you so very much for coming on the Power View Voice podcast, man. You ad- added so much great information and great value to this. Thank you so very much for your time. I appreciate you. Yeah, Johnny, I appreciate the, the work you're doing there and, and spreading the love, spreading the wisdom. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Johnny here. Thank you for listening to the Power of Your Voice podcast. I'd love to get your feedback on this episode and how it impacted you. If someone in your life could benefit from this episode, share it with them. Check out thepowerofyourvoice.com to read show notes, leave a comment on the blog page, and to stay updated on all future episodes, subscribe to this podcast and leave a five-star review. Thank you for your love and support.